This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel, but I don't want to take up much time because we have three uh, very interesting presentations, which will all probably be uh, better if they were each an hour long, but uh, we'll manage this in uh, much less time. Uh, and uh, the uh, three speakers are all uh, doing outstanding work in what is generally considered uh, basic research or basic and uh, translational research. All of these programs clearly have uh, relevance to uh, human disease, which is what makes them uh, exciting for this session. And so I'll start by introducing Maggie Feeney, who's an associate professor in uh, departments of pediatrics and medicine and also in the division of experimental medicine. And she's speaking about the human immune response to malaria insights from the children of Uganda. Maggie. Great, thank you very much, Phil, for that introduction, and thanks for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about our studies of human immunity to malaria in Ugandan children. Um, and this work represents a really big team effort between individuals in my lab here at San Francisco General uh, and also um, at our uh, collaborating site in Uganda, as well as a large number of clinical collaborators both here and there. So malaria remains the leading killer of children worldwide. Um, and malaria has been with us for over 100,000 years. So essentially, it is as old as humans. And we have co-evolved together. Um, and because of this, malaria has had a huge impact on the human genome, more than any other pathogen. Um, it has been estimated, based on hemoglobin S gene frequencies, that uh, before chloroquine, half of all deaths in Africa were due to falciparum malaria. So this is an enormous uh, evolutionary pressure. Uh, and this is important to consider if you want to understand immunity. But because of this important uh, evolutionary pressure, it's quite likely that there are many elements of the human immune response that have evolved simply to deal with malaria. Um, and malaria, for its part, has, has probably made many uh, evolutionary um, uh, turns as well to deal with the host immune response. And I think this was um, quite well articulated recently in a review article by Sue Pierce, where she said that it is entirely possible that malaria itself has shaped the immune mechanisms that come into play at the interface of the parasite and the human immune system, permitting chronic and recurrent infections by the parasite. Um, so that can serve as a little bit of foreshadowing of some of the data that I'm going to show you today. Um, but by way of general background, uh, natural immunity to malaria does emerge pretty reliably among children who grow up in endemic regions. Um, but it is slow, and it is imperfect, and it seems to develop in um, waves. Um, severe malaria afflicts mostly very young infants and children. Uh, if a child survives this period, they develop uh, resistance or immunity, you might say, to severe malaria, but they remain very vulnerable to uncomplicated ma malaria throughout much of their childhood. Um, later in childhood, into adolescence, we see um, that uh, incident infections with malaria are increasingly likely to become asymptomatic, and we, we term this clinical immunity. Um, it's not sterilizing immunity because parasitemia still develops often in, in adolescents and adults, but usually they don't get very sick. So it's a, a relative type of immunity. Um, if you type into PubMed, uh, and I did yesterday, the words malaria and immunology, you get more than 12,000 hits. Um, but I would venture to say that we know almost nothing about how this happens. We, we, really, we really have a very poor understanding of the immune effector mechanisms that are responsible for this process. Um, and there are many such potential immune 
effector mechanisms, and they have not all been uh, receiving equal attention over the years. The, the vast majority of the malaria immunology literature uh, has focused on uh, the humoral immune response or antibody response uh, mostly to blood stage infection. Um, that is the easiest to study um, and, uh, and accounts for most of the work that has been done to date. Uh, but I, I would venture that that has not really been terribly productive so far uh, and that there's a large amount, an increasing amount of data suggesting that actually it's the T cell response to malaria that is critical for protection. So my lab is focused on the cellular immune response to malaria, uh, primarily the T cell response, which has been woefully ignored uh, for most of, uh, of the previous decades. And to begin to address these questions, um, we, uh, my collaborators and I, have put into place um, over the past few years uh, several resources uh, in Uganda to study this. And this is building upon uh, more than decades long collaboration between McCarry University and UCSF, uh, of which Phil, um, our session chair, was one of the founding members. Um, our efforts focus on Tororo, which is shown here. It's a district in eastern Uganda near the Kenyan border uh, where malaria transmission occurs year round and transmission intensity is very, very, very high. Um, I think the most recent estimate of the entomological inoculation rate is 379 infectious bites per year. So that translates out as each child is getting a, more than one infectious bite per day. Um, due to some very timely and generous support from the UCSF CIFAR, we've been able to build out and equip uh, immunology laboratory on site at the existing clinic, uh, clinic study site. Um, and this laboratory is equipped with hoods and centrifuges and incubators, now a flow cytometer, backup generator, uh, liquid nitrogen freezers, really everything that's needed to do uh, state-of-the-art immunology right there on site uh, in this very remote rural location. And we now have um, a dozen people working in this lab on projects related to malaria immunology. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, this lab is co-located with the study clinic. Um, this study clinic is a site where there are several ongoing longitudinal cohort studies and clinical trials, mostly led by Grant Dorsey, who's a very important collaborator of mine. Uh, and they collectively enroll over 1,000 kids who are seen uh, for regular periodic visits. So this is really a dream for us because these kids come in for their study clinic visits anyhow. Um, if they're consented to do so, they donate a little extra blood for immunology. The tube of blood just needs to be passed to the next room. Uh, and in addition to being able to do a lot of our work right there on site, we have access to a, an incredibly robust data set um, from Grant and his team uh, that captures really all of the incident malaria cases in all of these children and also includes periodic screening for asymptomatic parasitemia. So we're able to um, make uh, uh, um, correlations between our, our in vitro studies and, the, in, and the, um, the child's clinical malaria experience. And just in very general terms, um, uh, our hypotheses center around um, the, the, the hypothesis that malaria-specific T cell response is critical for protective immunity but that it may be subverted by immunoregulatory mechanisms in the setting of the really chronic heavy antigen exposure that we see in a high incident site like this. I'd also like to just point out that the um, gentleman here is Pras Jagannathan, who is a, a junior faculty member in my lab, and he uh, has been responsible for generating most of the data that I'm going to show you today. Um, so in Press's first project in my lab, he uh, examined cross-sectionally a large cohort of 78 children uh, who were being followed in a CDC-funded funded study. Uh, and they were, at this point, around four years of age, and they had um, been a birth cohort. So we have clinical incidence data uh, from birth through five years of age. Um, and what Press did is he looked cross-sectionally using intracellular cytokine staining um, to see the response to malaria antigens. And what he found was that there is a striking difference in the functional phenotype of CD4 T cells depending on the child's 
prior malaria incidents. There were um, modest differences in the overall frequency of these cells, but much more striking was the difference in the functional phenotype of these cells. And the basic pattern was that um, children with heavy prior malaria exposure, which we define as more than eight episodes per person year, so that's very, very heavy exposure, um, had a CD4 T cell response that was dominated by co-production of IL-10 and interferon gamma co-producing cells. Um, and IL-10 is thought to be a regulatory cytokine that in many contexts plays a role in dampening the immune response. Um, and these TR1 cells, or IL-10-producing T cells, um, have been implicated in other parasitic disease models, such as Leishmania and toxoplasmosis, to um, modulate the immune response uh, such that there's decreased tissue inflammation, but at the cost of parasite persistence and an inability of the animal to clear the parasite. Um, so this has not previously been described in the setting of malaria. Um, and in contrast, children uh, who had relatively low exposure, so fewer than two episodes per person year, uh, had a CD4 T cell response that was more inflammatory and, and um, tended to co-produce the classic inflammatory cytokines TNF, alpha, and interferon gamma. Um, so this raises the, the obvious question of whether um, these T cells of either phenotype were protective. And we did, uh, as I mentioned, have prospective incidence data for another year following um, the time that we did these assays. Uh, when we looked um, in a univariate analysis, uh, production of IL-10, um, either uh, any IL-10 or this dominant phenotype of IL-10 and interferon gamma co-producing cells was associated with an increased future risk of malaria, whereas um, cells that produce TNF in the absence of IL-10 or interferon gamma uh, was associated with prospective protection from malaria. Um, however, this univariate analysis is, is rather flawed in that it fails to be able to take into account heterogeneity, heterogeneity in malaria exposure. Uh, and I told you that these kids who made a lot of IL-10 had had a lot of malaria in the past, so it's quite possible that these kids, you know, live down by the swamp, and these kids live in a nice concrete house in town. Um, and so, to attempt to adjust for some of this heterogeneity and exposure, uh, we included in a multivariate model uh, other parameters that we uh, associate with exposure, including the recency of infection and uh, the amount of malaria that they'd had in the past. Um, and we found uh, that with this adjustment, the protective, apparent protective effect of TNF alpha producing T cells was no longer seen. Um, and also, there was um, less significance to this, uh, to this association between IL 10 and increased risk, although it remained uh, somewhat borderline significant. Um, changing gears just a bit, in Press's uh, second project, he looked at the role of gamma delta T cells in malaria in this same cohort. Um, gamma delta T cells are a minor population of T cells in the peripheral blood. Um, they are sometimes characterized as being semi-innate because they have restricted TCR variability, um, and they can often recognize antigens, which are non-peptide antigens, uh, immediately without processing or presentation. So one of the major subsets of gamma delta T cells is called VD2 cells, and this subset has intrinsic reactivity to malaria antigens, so even in naive hosts, and this has been known for a long time. Um, what these cells do is that they recognize non-peptide antigens, uh, specifically called phosphoantigens that are made by the plasmodial apicoplast, um, and they mount a very inflammatory response when they recognize this antigen. Um, it has also been shown in the literature that these cells expand rapidly in vivo following malaria infection in naive individuals, uh, reaching frequencies in the peripheral blood up to 30 percent or so. Um, so these plots just show the <clears throat> various subtypes of gamma delta T cells. The uh, ones that stay in gamma delta low correspond to the um, delta II subset, and it is the subset that makes all of the cytokines. Uh, mostly in interferon gamma and TNF-alpha uh, co-producing co response um, with some IL-2 as well. So when we um, looked at gamma-delta T cells in our cohort, the same cohort described before, 
uh, what was most striking is that there is a very prominent uh, inverse relationship between the number of these Delta II cells in the blood and the amount of malaria that the child has had in the past. So it looks like there is a uh, progressive decline in the frequency of these cells with increasing exposure to malaria. Uh, and this relationship has borne out in other cohorts where we've looked at the same thing. We also looked at the function uh, on a per cell basis of these Delta II cells, and we found uh, something similar. Um, the ability of uh, these Delta II cells to produce this inflammatory burst of in interferon gamma and TNF was, was majorly blunted uh, in children who had had more prior malaria. Uh, and these data were backed up by um, gene expression data um, uh, derived from a microarray experiment, which also identified additional cytokines uh, whose response was very blunted in kids who had been heavily exposed to malaria in the past. Um, and just looking at another parameter of malaria-specific function, we assessed the proliferative response to malaria antigens uh, in, of these cells uh, and found uh, something very similar. With increasing incidence of prior malaria, there was a blunting of the ability to proliferate in response to malaria antigens. Um, so we hypothesized, uh, based on this loss and dysfunction of Delta II cells that we see with increasing malaria exposure, we hypothesized that repeated infection may lead to the upregulation of immunoregulatory pathways that dampen the innate uh, V delta II inflammatory response as a means to ev evade host immunopathology. And so to test this, we compared um, global gene expression patterns of uh, sort purified V delta II cells unstimulated from kids who had had high uh, malaria exposure with greater than eight episodes per person year or low exposure, less than two. Uh, and we found quite dramatic differences in basal gene expression. Um, uh, and a large number of the genes that were differentially expressed, uh, shown in red here, were ones that have known immunoregulatory functions. Um, so it does seem that um, many genes that are implicated in immunoregulation are upregulated in the setting of this heavy antigen exposure. And one in particular, um, TIM3 here, uh, which has been um, shown to have a role in T cell tolerance and exhaustion, was markedly um, differentially expressed when we confirmed these by flow cytometry. So finally, we sought to determine uh, the relationship between the frequency and function of Delta II cells and protection from symptomatic malaria uh, as assessed during one year of prospective uh, observation and follow-up. Um, and strikingly, we found that kids who had at least one uh, incident infection during the period of observation that was asymptomatic had a much lower frequency of these malaria-responsive uh, gamma Delta II cells than um, kids who, who developed fever and full-blown malaria with each new malaria infection. And when analyzed in a different way, uh, we found that the probability of developing symptoms if infected was strikingly lower in kids who had uh, been in the lowest tertial of gamma delta II responsiveness compared to those who were in the highest tertial. Um, and this was a very re robust response that um, remained strong or even stronger after accounting for other uh, potential correlates of exposure in the past. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we've shown that heavy malaria exposure uh, induces conventional alpha-beta T cells um, to produce IL-10 uh, and have a more regulatory phenotype. Uh, and that these cells um, may interfere with parasite clearance and do not show protection against uh, future infection. Uh, we also show that uh, repeated infection with malaria is associated with a loss and a dysfunction of V delta II gamma delta T cells, um, the subset that is intrinsically reactive to malaria antigens, and that this progressive loss and dysfunction correlates with the transition to asymptomatic infection. Um, Together, this might sound quite depressing uh, in terms of its implication for vaccine approaches because we um, want in a vaccine to be able to prime an adaptive immune response to the parasite uh, and 
what we are observing is more of a loss of an innate or semi-innate immune response. Um, but I think that the, a, a potential response to that is naturally acquired immunity is not necessarily what we want to mimic in a vaccine. It's incomplete, it is uh, not sterilizing, and it is relatively short-lived. Uh, and that there are other precedents um, that have been shown in experimental uh, animal and human models recently that are much more promising and are based more um, on a model of priming uh, T cell response to pre or other cytic antigens. So I, I definitely still think there's hope. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, all of these people who are involved in doing the work, but particularly Pras Jagannathan, who was a, a, the major driving force for both of these projects. Charlie Kim was uh, enormously helpful with all the microarray data. Uh, Grant Dorsey is my main clinical collaborator. I couldn't work without him. And Felicitas Nankia is our very talented uh, lab manager for our Truro lab. Thank you. I don't consider running over in a talk a terrible sin because I commit it every time I give a talk. But um, we're moving along and hopefully we'll have time at the end for a few questions and, and of course uh, you can reach any of the speakers uh, here today or by email to ask them further questions about the research. Next speaker is Dabrowski Herbert who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine also at the Division of Experimental Medicine. Uh, we're changing gears from malaria to worms, an area that really very few people around the world study at a basic level. So we're really excited to have Dabrowski at UCSF where he came recently. Uh, and his title is The Global Impact of Helminth Infections. Dabrowski. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank GSS and particularly uh, the Burke family for allowing me to be here today. Uh, Phil didn't tell you I was an undergraduate in his lab many years ago, so um, this is very much like coming home here at UCSF. Uh, so yes, uh, what I'm going to tell you today is a brief story about my favorite class of pathogens. I've been interested in parasitic worms uh, as since a child, uh, growing up in South Mississippi. Parasitic worms, uh, the hookworms in particular, as these, these uh, images show you, were once a very important uh, pathogen in the U.S. They've since been dealt with, but across the globe, parasitic worms are, are really a global health threat. And this is to Im impress upon you the numbers. Uh, parasitic roundworms, such as Ascaris, infect up to a billion people uh, currently. Uh, other Worms such as Trichurius, the whipworm, or a very important problem leading to some of that um, childhood diarrhea that was mentioned earlier. Hookworms, which I'll tell you about today, are in fact roughly 740 million people worldwide and, and are one of the main causes of this maternal uh, anemia. They cause premature uh, uh, abortions in pregnant women. And so they, they are really a, a big problem as well. And it's just assumes, which are really my, my first love in, from sophomore year of college. Uh, they currently infect up to about 250 million people uh, worldwide. Right? And so when we think about host protection in the laboratory, we can look at host protection in two different ways. One is through to prevent excess tissue injury caused by parasitic forms and their antigens that elicit, to, uh, elicit a very strong inflammatory response. Alternatively, we look at protection as immune-mediated destruction or removal of organisms from the body. So you can imagine uh, tapeworms living in the lumen of the, the bowel being pushed out of the host by the weep and sweep response, which is colloquially known. So we have to get pretty creative in, in studying worms, and, and we constantly challenge ourselves on how do we understand the requirements for immunity against helmets. I finished my degree in uh, immunology. So we have a couple of choices, <laughs> right? Um, our models, uh, we can either choose mice or we hope to go on to translational studies here. <laughs> okay, so helmets, we know today, elicit a very characteristic response. It's a type 2 immune response. We know now that this is a very similar, almost a, a identical response to the allergic response. So this uh, makes the work have even a broader relevance. But that tissue injury itself is a, is a precipitating factor in that type 2 immune response. So I'm, I'm depicting here how our epithelial cells and mucosal surfaces, you think in the ocular, 
uh, the respiratory and their GI tract, uh, once they're damaged by parasitic worms, this really wakes up the immune response. And so the, the first parasite I'm going to briefly go over, uh, Schistosoma mansoni, a, a major human pathogen. It comes in a, a couple of medically relevant forms. I'm not going to take you through any depth in this, in this life cycle, but I do want to point out a couple of important points. It is vector-borne. So exposure to uh, water, so like Lake Victoria, uh, there's very famous studies leading to the understanding that co-infection between schistosomes and HIV leads to a very uh, a, a severe form of, of disease. So schistosomes are a comorbidity. And also, these parasites transiently migrate through the lung, but also they, they go on to inhabit the GI tract. So uh, there's a lot of studies with uh, modeling ulcerative colitis and different types of IBDs by using worms. Now these parasites, they're intravascular and they're virtually silent within the host. Now approve the, the, um, excuse the graphic nature of these photos, but it took me five years to get this uh, image. I show it everywhere I can get a chance, <laughs> right? And so these are worm pairs. This, this mouse is modeling a, a parasite infected individual where the, the worm pairs release up to 1,000 worms daily. Now, portal blood flow is going in the opposite direction, right? So absorption of nutrients is occurring here. Blood flow is going up into the liver. These eggs, on the, they're actually trying to go out into the fecal stream, but get swept into the, uh, the hepatic tissue. And so you, you find worms that are in the hepatic organs, but they've certainly evolved to avoid the immune response. You can see very little inflammation against the adult forms, but an intense inflammatory infiltrate that's induced against the eggs. And, it, and we think now that the eggs are, have evolved to induce very robust immune responses in order to facilitate transmission. So there's a lot of initiatives to try to understand immunoregulation of schistosome infection. And so the, one of the major pathological sequelae from schistosome infections is, is shown here. This is pipe stem fibrosis. So individuals get an enormous amount of, of liver fibrosis with this organism and uh, splenomegaly. Okay, now we can model this very, very nicely in mice. So the mouse model is quite, a, quite an appropriate a way to try to understand immunological mechanisms against this organism. And in this way, we hope that we can devise novel ways of treating and, 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 and preventing the reinfection, which is probably the most important com uh, component of this disease. So you can see the involvement of the liver, the spleen, and the GI tract. Now, uh, the published work that's come out of my group has, has suggested the following scenario, is that once eggs enter the tissues of their host, they're interacted with by, this is an antigen-presenting cell, this is a uh, phagocytic cell, a macrophage, that helps the, their T cells to produce very canonical type 2 cytokines, IL-4. This acts back on macrophages to indeed, with this cross-communication to get uh, macrophages to produce uh, factors that promote regulation and antagonize inflammatory responses. And in that way, uh, chronic infection, long-term infection, and mitigation of all this, this uh, path potentially pathological inflammation is mediated, all right? Okay, so uh, the other uh, parasite I'm gonna quickly tell you about are hookworms. And that's the, we are very actively studying hookworms today and, and, and because it has all these different um, uh, relevance to, to the human disease and pathology and organ function. I'm just pretty excited about hookworms today. These parasites are, are, are transmitted by soil, so infected soil. This is among the soil transmitted helminth uh, uh, species. They're directly skin penetrators, so individuals walking uh, without protecting uh, a skin foot protection, but also I've come to understand with, with, with our studies in Brazil that a lot of infections mediated uh, by the arms as people are, are farming in areas where hookworms are prevalent. Uh, the pathology involves both the GI tract but also the lung because the way this parasite makes it to the in GI tract is that the, once infection, uh, once it enters the hose, it enters the bloodstream, uh, they travel to the alveoli, they break out of the alveoli, they're coughed up and swallowed to enter the GI tract. It's quite a, quite a um, 
uh, elegant pathway, I would say. Now, once the worms are, are latched onto the intestinal wall, the, here is where host immunity can uh, occur by eliminating that second mode of host protection that I mentioned by eliminating worms from the GI tract. The central problem with hookworms is the high rates of reinfection. I don't have the correlation coefficients to show you right now, but in, in endemic areas, particularly in Brazil and, and certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa, individuals uh, have greater hookworm burdens as they age. Whereas most other parasitic worm infections, the immune response is able to somewhat keep those, the, the, the infectious load in check. Hookworms are unique in that the burdens actually increase with age. And we can model this um, again with, with mice. Um, again, uh, the, we, we can culture the parasites, inoculate animals that go through this uh, lung and GI tract uh, migration. And this type of pathology is observed very quickly within the lung. So we're, we're asking two questions here. Was how is the lung pathology mitigated? You can see these uh, he um, hemorrhagic spots here. And also, how is worm expulsion mediated? And so to tie that up, what we've, we've recently published and, and we're continually uh, investigating this mechanism is that following worm uh, disruption of the mucosal epithelial cell layer, and we think that allergens are working in somewhat the same manner because the allergens have ways of, of damaging mucosal epithelial cells. But nonetheless, there are repair factors released that, from the epithelium. Uh, we've evolved to, to rapidly seal mucosal barriers following mechanical or chemical injury, and particularly uh, infectious injury. And so the factors such as trifold factor two, which is our, our favorite molecule right now that we pair with our worm models, uh, programs the myeloid phagocytes to produce cytokines that instruct T cells in which lineage to uh, uh, their li lineage differentiation. Right? And so that feeds back on the epithelium to in induce the epithelium to make factors that we've also demonstrated lead to the uh, limiting the ability of worms to feed upon their host and facilitating the expulsion from the GI tract. And so in my lab, that's what, that's what we're doing right now. We, we're characteristically a mouse laboratory, and we're very rapidly moving with the assistance of this new funding into other more translational studies. Okay, so parasitic helmets have a major impact on global health. The mechanisms are really poorly understood, and, but understanding these mechanisms may provide novel insight for vaccines and therapeutics. So this is my, my former group and my new group, and we are just crazy about worms. Thank you very much. <laughs>who actually was on time. Uh, Joe is up here quickly because he's trying some really fancy audiovisual extravaganza that's probably going to fail, but we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, Joe has done a lot of, uh, he, no, Joe is a professor in uh, biochemistry and biophysics here and also a Howard Hughes investigator. He's done a lot of groundbreaking basic research in malaria, but his talk here is a little more the translational side of what he does dealing with uh, anti-malarial drug discovery. And are you ready? Let's see how it goes. Yeah, the high tech part of this is using your own laptop. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, so first of all, thanks for having me here. We're going to swing back to malaria here a little bit. And uh, I'm a basic scientist here in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF. We spend a lot of time in our malaria research looking at the basic biology of the parasite, molecular mechanisms of its life cycle, and other aspects of its cell biology, genetics and genomics. But uh, I'm going to take this opportunity today to talk about some of our more um, practical work on malaria that could have more immediate impact than sort of the basic science stuff. And that's great, because I usually don't get a chance to talk about this uh, material in most of the basic science uh, meetings that I go to and so on, because they're not that interested in it. But I think this audience might be. <laughs> OK, so uh, probably I shouldn't have said that. OK. <laughs> not enough coffee. <clears throat> there are reasons to be optimistic in malaria. And this is like one of the first times in many years that we've been able to say this. It's pretty amazing. Between 2000 and 2012, according to the most recent World Malaria Report, 
overall mortality rates have fell by 45% in all age groups. 3.3 million deaths have been averted. Financing has increased to $1.8 billion in malaria. Uh, and artemisinin combination treatments, uh, or ACTS, have been uh, delivered and have reached levels of 331 million in 2012, which is really quite extraordinary considering how bleak the situation was uh, 10, 13 years ago, which it truly was bleak. Uh, and this includes major advances in everything, in, in vector control, chemo prevention, diagnostic testing, treatment, surveillance, monitoring, all across the board. Uh, and the places where there's been the largest decreases or major decreases in incidence of malaria are all exactly where you would want them to be. There are still many areas right in the central uh, areas of Africa that are still in dire need of, in, of bigger decreases, but all the directions and all the indicators are pointing generally in the right direction. It's forecast that by 2015, uh, incidence of malaria will have dropped by 65 percent, and that's pretty amazing. Okay, however, note of caution, there's still 3.4 billion people at risk for malaria, and it's estimated by WHO estimates that 627,000 deaths occurred in malaria in 2012, and then we all know that these were mostly children. The global requirements for control of malaria is estimated to be 5.1 billion. So there's still a major financing gap between what is happening now and what will be required, what is required now to deal with the situation. This is worrisome because increases in international financing have slowed considerably over the last few years. They've not stopped, but they've slowed. And uh, more uh, worrisome on the treatment side of things, resistance to the frontline drug artemisinin, which is a major component in almost all these combination therapies, has been detected in at least four countries in Southeast Asia. And in at least a couple cases, there's been resistance to the combination of therapies, not just the monotherapy. However, they're still very useful and they're still being used. So we're going to transition now to talking about treatment, drugs for malaria. This is a slide from MMV, Medicines for Malaria Venture. It's a snapshot of the global portfolio of medications in development or in use right now for malaria. Uh, and the good news is lots of really interesting new drugs in development or being deployed against malaria, lots of them. And 10, 12 years ago, this slide was mostly blank. Um, and the only worrisome thing here, so that's good, the bad thing is that a lot of these drugs, all the ones in this sort of salmon color, uh, especially in some of the ones in the yellow, are all artemisinin or artisanate derivatives, that they're mainly based on the same kind of compound uh, partnered with various different other kinds of drugs. And so what uh, has become recently apparent is that we're going to need drugs that have differing mechanisms of action, have orthogonal targets and ways of attacking the parasite. So MMV has defined target candidate pro uh, profiles, that is, what would you like to see in a malaria drug? And there's really four basic categories. One is, we'd like a drug that's super fast clearing, you know, deal with the problem right now, cure the patient as fast as you can. Number two, we'd like a drug that's long acting so that after you've cleared the initial parasites, you have drugs that will hang around and deal with any stragglers and prevent resistance. Third, you would also like to block transmission, so target, like for example, the sexual phases of the parasite to stop the transmission cycle in from patient to patient. And in fourth, obviously you'd like to have drugs that are involved in chemo prevention, the treatment of small kids, pregnant women, and others that would prevent uh, malaria from happening in the first place. These four target candidate profiles would be in effect at various points in the, in the life cycle of the parasite. The height here is supposed to represent the, the parasite load in each of these situations. And what we've been concerned with in my lab is mainly the blood phase of the parasite. And so what we've been concentrating on things that would be responsive to the first candidate profile. To get a little more specific, MMV defines this as, so this is our fast clearing drug, right? It should be an oral single dose. I mean, that would be, so these are ideal. You know, this is what you should strive for. It's not necessarily what is achievable. But obviously, if you had a single dose radical cure for malaria, that would be pretty amazing. Oral single dose with 100% efficacy at day seven. You would like to have rapid clearance of the parasite, six logs of total parasite removal as fast as you can. It's got to be as fast or faster than the gold standard, which is artesanate, which is 48 hours. Uh, 
low uh, susceptibility to resistance, and you would have to know what the markers are of resistance. So if it's starting to occur, you could track it, monitor it, and deal with it, contain it if necessary. No interactions with other drugs, that would be nice. Wide clinical safety profile, it should probably be, should be higher on the list here, but, um, and of low cost of goods, so less than a, a quarter for a dose or a um, treatment course. So my lab has been involved in malaria drug discovery and uh, development in collaboration with this guy, Dr. Kip Guy. Kip was here at UCSF as well um, uh, and was made an offer he couldn't refuse at St. Jude Children's Hospital and so went back to Tennessee. But we've continued to maintain our grants together and collaborate together over these past 12 years. And we involved in a number of different drug discovery and development uh, programs. And I'm just gonna focus on one, tell you about one that I'm very excited about. After uh, several years of what I could say just, um, well, it was a learning experience, but some might also call it ruinous failure. Um, <clears throat> we decided to take a different route, and instead of trying to get too clever about the malaria drug development, went back to good old-fashioned high-throughput screening, looking for compounds that inhibit malaria. And uh, Kip uh, rolled out a new screen, building on uh, screens that we had started actually here at UCSF. 300,000 compounds yielded uh, some number of hits. And then from these hits, selected the dihydroisoquinolones as a candidate series to pursue. This, uh, this was the initial hit, and then many years of medicinal chemistry and details, which I'm not going to go into or have the time for, resulted in this lead compound, which I'm just going to call SJ733. And I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you about this compound, because it's really interesting. First of all, it's potent, very potent against falciparum, 31 nanomolar EC50. It's highly soluble, highly permeable and highly bioavailable, about 65% or better bioavailability in preclinical animal modeling, uh, testing. It has excellent PK properties. It has a very wide therapeutic window, may, maybe perhaps as wide as 65-fold. It has a linear dose response in all the animal models. It does not inhibit cytochrome P450, so it doesn't interfere with the breakdown of other drugs and compounds. It has no genotoxicity. It's not going to mess with your DNA. That's good. No phototoxicity. It has no measurable interactions with other receptors or kinases or enzymes. No significant toxicological response at any dose in the rodent models. It has a maximum tolerated rate of dose of above 750 mg per kg, which means it's a really safe compound by um, preclinical testing standards. Now, there's some interesting features of this compound. So here is the graph of, um, this is parasite survival, log parasite survival, and the number of hours of treatment. And the black line is SJ733, and this bluish line is artemisinin, and it's pyrimethamine and tovacone for comparison. So you can kind of look at this graph and say, okay, well, about 48 hours, yeah, meh. It's about right. Um, you know, our testinator, our artemisinin, looks a lot better in this graph. That is the gold standard. So that's in vitro testing. There is something funny, though, going on here when you compare in vitro to in vivo. When we look at in vivo testing, SJ733 clears as fast or faster than artemisinin, with parasites dropping to totally undetectable levels uh, in 48 hours. But uh, what's remarkable here is it, is it beats all these compounds in vivo testing. And this is falciparum humanized mouse models in which this data is acquired from. So there is a discrepancy between in vitro um, action and in vivo action. Now the next question is after you get a hit is really what's the target? You know, this is just a compound that works against cells. You have no idea what it's really doing. And so this is where my lab played most of uh, our part in uh, trying to figure out what the target of this drug is. And usually how this is done, well, it's, there's not a usual way it's done. I'll back up by saying that. In malaria, the state of the art now is actually to select for mutations that give resistance and follow it by whole genome sequencing. There was a day when the genetics were so miserable in malaria, it was really um, very difficult to find targets. Now, with the advent of cheap, ultra-deep sequencing, you literally can sequence dozens of genomes in a single day and find any mutation, any alteration in the genome anywhere, anytime, for not a lot of money. And this is changed the face of how we do genetics in malaria. 
So what we did is we did seven independent drug selections with different derivatives of the compound and different strains of malaria. We sequenced the resulting clones that grew out of these selections, which had uh, one, uh, basically one to two logs of resistance. We sequenced these genomes anywhere from 60x to 300-fold x coverage of the genome, leave no snip unturned sort of situation, scorched earth. And we identified non-synonymous mutations in only a single gene for these selections. And this was PFATP4. So uh, what is that? So PFATP4 is a really interesting um, channel. It's basically a, a, a pump that extrudes sodium out of the intraerythrocytic parasite in exchange for um, uh, hydrogen ions. And uh, it maintains the sodium homeostasis in the parasite. Bill's waving at me to hurry up, so I will. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a, a target incidentally, of a lead compound that Novartis owns called NITD609. So we hit a target that's uh, already in development for another compound. That's not going to stop us from developing ours. It's completely different. I was going to do a little more high-tech 3D show here, but I'm just going to, from the interest of time, zoom ahead to a picture of inside this channel. This is the presumptive sodium channel where the sodium ions would go through this transmembrane span. This is a homology model. We don't have a crystal structure yet. And this is where our compound is predicted to bind. It's a docking experiment, and this is the best place on the protein where the compound docks. And the red is the location of the resistance mutations we selected for, which supports the, the docking of the compound in that area. And so we would predict the treatment of the drug, uh, parasites with this drug, would block its ability to extrude sodium, and you would accumulate sodium inside the parasite. And through patch clamp electrophysiology experiments done in Kirian Kirk's lab, that's exactly what happens. And so as you increase SJ733, the um, sodium concentration in the parasite rises considerably. And of course, in the resistant parasite, it takes more drug to produce that same effect. That does not answer this very interesting question, though. Why does this thing clear so rapidly? What, what's, the, what's the secret sauce of this compound? So we thought about it, and one of the um, the ideas that came to mind, well, as vion homeostasis is being wrecked, perhaps something structural is going on in the red blood cell for which the parasite resides in. Perhaps it's not the drug clearing the parasite so quickly, it's somehow the immune system or the body's own physiology is being facilitated to clear the parasites quickly. And perhaps there is changes in the red blood cell itself. And so the idea is maybe the rigidity or structure of the parasite is being changed. And how can we measure that? Turns out that uh, Hong Man Chen, um, a colleague at University of British Columbia, made a little microfluidic device where you can shove blood cells through a pore and measure their fluidity. We invited him down here, and I participated in a bunch of the experiments. And here we are shoving a red blood cell with a parasite in it, that's the parasite, this little ball right here, through a pore. And if you measure the pressure, it takes to shove the parasite through the pore, that in turn is a direct measure of the cortical tension of the membrane or how stiff it is. There it is. Now what we're doing is we're cranking up the pressure there to force it through there. Now imagine doing that again and again and again for day after end. You want to um, shoot yourself, actually. <laughs> it's so boring. And so I'm, so I'm speaking from experience. And so he designed a high throughput way of doing it, and so now you can measure thousands of cells simultaneously and so on. And the, the result, the, the, why I'm telling you this is, is that indeed treatment with SJ733 produces a significant increase in the rigidity of the infected red blood cell, but not the uninfected red blood cell. That's critical here. And other drugs like artesanate and chloroquine do not produce the same increases in rigidity. And so I'm just going to finish here by saying that I think the drugs that kill parasites are great, but drugs that kill parasites and make those red blood cells that are infected more visible to the surveillance and quality control systems of the body to clear them rapidly by whatever mechanism, spleen, lung, liver, that's actually an interesting subject, it is, uh, may actually result in a rapidly clearing compound rather than one that just kills. We believe SJ33 is responsive to the target candidate profile MMV is laid out. It's extremely low cost of goods. No time to tell you about it, but it is also transmission blocking.
and it has been awarded preclinical candidate status at MMV, and we are now looking for funding, sorry, we're now looking for funding to uh, launch phase one to two B studies, which is our next goal. A lot of people worked on this project, the ones in Boulder here at UCSF, a lot of funders involved, including NIID, MMV, Howard Hughes, Packard Foundation, and of course, St. Jude's, and it all wouldn't have been possible without my key collaborator, Kip Guy. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thanks uh, for this, to the speakers for three uh, great talks. And um, I guess we'll have everybody come up. I'm not sure exactly how to do this. Uh, uh, two people could sit, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, names are changing. Uh, and uh, questions. We don't, we're, we're a little over, but we do have a few minutes for questions. Well, I'll, I'll start by asking Maggie as she sits down. Are gamma delta T cells good for you or bad for you in terms of malaria? Um, I, they do not confer protection, so I think they oh. confer symptomatology and are not particularly good for you. So despite the fact that P. falciparum had this massive impact on human evolution, in this case, uh, this is a piece of the immune system that only does harm in terms of malaria? Um, I, it's, I mean, it's a really good question. I think we're just at the beginning of trying to understand this. I think that they uh, do um, lyse merozoites, and they do have uh, anti-merozoid activity during the blood stage of infection. Um, but from the human perspective, I mean, whether or not that contributes to clearing infections, it, it, it's entirely possible that it does. It doesn't confirm memory. It doesn't prevent reinfection. Um, so that might be sort of the, the trade-off that, that occurs there. Okay, I guess next year at this symposium you can answer all these questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, for De Dabrowski, uh, you mentioned that uh, adult schistosomes have almost no impact on the immune system, but eggs lead to this dramatic inflammatory response, which of course is responsible for disease, and that that seemed to be a parasite mechanism to enhance transmission. Um, could you explain why you think that is? I mean, how does that happen? So uh, I'll cite the, the work from the Kenyan car washers. <clears throat> it sh showed where HIV-infected individuals that were also schistosomes, uh, mensidae positive, had an accumulation of eggs. They had a decreased egg expulsion, and that corresponded very closely with their drop in CD4 counts. So I think that is probably the most widely cited study to, um, and also with, with studies in mice that have, have, have um, you know, backed that up, to show that, that really it's, it's a co-evolution. You know, the parasite has evolved with the human host to kind of avoid and even manipulate the immune system. And if the immune system is no longer active, there's also a, a study coming from uh, Stephen Davies, who worked with uh, um, Jim McCaro, showing that uh, mice deficient in T and B cells have a failure of parasite development. So there's there's a lot of different uh, of work showing that really the host uh, immune system and the parasite are just intimately connected, and they actually rely on one another. Um, and so this leads again to this idea of, of regulatory responses. So when, 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 uh, when Maggie was speaking, I was thinking about this IL-10 production as possibly um, related to a co-infection with helmets. And we, we've talked quite a bit about uh, working together on asking whether, whether different parasites manipulate the immune response to so, um, question to Joe. I, mean, I wasn't, frankly, uh, very aware of, uh, of your work with malaria. Um, we know that Sir Richard Feacham is very involved, and, and Maggie. Are there opportunities at UCSF where kind of all of the malaria people uh, get together and trade notes? Can you t talk about? Yeah, actually, Phil uh, started a, um, a Bay Area malaria meeting sort of thing called BAM, and, and it's, it's, you know, gone through peaks and valleys through its times, depending on who's here in the Bay Area doing this. But yeah, there, there are local uh, meetings for trading notes. A lot of it, 
It depends, though. A lot of it is on the basic science and other areas. The drug development arms are rather specialized major team efforts and um, are less conducive to the small, let's trade notes sort of situation. No, but it's kind of a fun thing. I People who work in a lot of other areas don't have this, but when you work in malaria, and this is true for some of the other uh, specific diseases we're talking about here, uh, it's quite common for people to communicate across huge, a huge range of expertise. And, and what we have at UCSF now is, is amazing. We have uh, world-leading policy groups, world-leading basic science groups, and a lot of what's in between those two. Uh, it's a really uh, exciting situation that we have now. Uh, and obviously, uh, the more that GHS can do to bring everybody together, uh, the better. What Joe referred to specifically right now, we have an every three months Bay Area malaria meeting. It happens to be over in the East Bay to partly benefit from some help from a small company there, Amaris, who supports this, and also to encourage people to come from the farther reaches of the Bay Area, like Davis and, and the South Bay. Uh, and we've just had a few sessions so far. We started that this year, but everybody's invited. And if anybody needs to get on the mailing list for that, let me know. Okay, I guess we'll finish this up and Paul will continue.